Fichte begins with the I, and the idea of self-positing. What is unique about the mind is its ability to reflect on itself, to posit itself in his terminology, that is, to be aware of itself. So the I, he says, freely posits itself. It is self-positing, it's aware of itself, it is self-aware, it's conscious of itself, and it reflects on itself. Now, we can say more, he says, because not only is the I aware of itself, it is aware of its own awareness of itself. It is conscious of the consciousness it has of itself. So it posits itself as self-positing. We can even define the mind as the kind of thing that is able to do that. The I is essentially something that posits itself as self-positing. Well, self-consciousness, we have to recognize here, has a kind of dual character. It is both an activity that we engage in, in being aware of ourselves, but it's also something like the product that then we can reflect upon. So it's the object of reflection as well as the act of reflecting itself. So in being conscious of myself, I'm aware of myself, that's the activity part, but then I am also aware of my awareness of myself. There it's treated as something like a product or as an object of reflection. And so there is this kind of funny dual character. In reflecting, I am reflecting but on myself as reflect dead as well as reflecting, and then reflecting on the act of reflecting itself. So there's a complicated division here. You might get a foreshadowing here of Sartre's discussion in Being and Nothingness on the distinction between the reflecting consciousness and the reflected consciousness. That idea, I think, is already there in Fichte, and if anything, more elaborated, more complicated in Fichte than it is ultimately in Sartre. But that is the kind of echo we find later in the history of philosophy from Fichte's ideas. Self-consciousness is but not only an action and also a product, it is an act and also a fact. He sometimes says it's a fact act. Not exactly elegant, but that's the idea. There is a reflection on itself, so it is both the action and also the fact, the object, the product, the thing being reflected upon. That can make it sound complicated, but really the idea is that the self is essentially transparent to itself. I am aware of myself, I'm aware of my own awareness of myself. That is automatic. That is built into the nature of my consciousness. Consciousness is a practical as well as a theoretical sort of activity. It is practical in that it is a kind of activity. It is moreover something that well, can be understood through my own self-reflection, even within myself. I don't have to go out and do cognitive psychology. I can look inward to understand something about the nature of my mind and my own consciousness. But also, as an act as well as a fact, there is something about practical reason as well as theoretical reason that's involved in my doing that. So already here you can get a glimpse of pragmatism entering the picture, where that theme is elaborated much more in later thinkers like Hegel and Peirce and a variety of other American thinkers. But the key idea is already there, that in being conscious I am engaged in a kind of activity, and practical reason as well as theoretical reason are involved in governing that activity. Now Fichte goes a bit further. The I is not a substance. It's instead a kind of activity, an activity of self-awareness. And he thinks that has some important implications. One of them is not only that both practical reason and theoretical reason are involved in consciousness, but also that in the end those are really identical. Now that's a somewhat surprising fact, but I think the reason is that the action and the object, the product, the fact, those are not two separate things. Consciousness presupposes self-consciousness, and so that awareness of itself and the awareness of the awareness of itself, those things are built into the nature of consciousness itself. It's not as if we have consciousness directed at the outside world, which is governed by theoretical reason, and to some extent by practical reason, and then a special kind of activity of reflection that gives us a different kind of knowledge, a different kind of intellectual access. Consciousness is something that involves self-consciousness and positing oneself as self-positing 
all at the same time. And so that's why he ends up saying it's not just that I need practical reason and theoretical reason. There's a practical aspect and a theoretical aspect. It's more than that. In the end, they come to the same thing. The fact and the act are identical. There is not a distinction between the fact on the one hand and the act on the other. Instead, the activity is the thing being reflected upon. They are the same thing. And so in the end, he says, I can't find a way of distinguishing practical reason from theoretical reason. It looks like we've got a theoretical activity here going on at the same time as a practical activity. And actually, it's just one activity. They are the same activity two separate aspects to the same activity. He says, I don't know how to distinguish them. It is both of those things at once. They really end up being the same thing. Now, here is what in Fichte makes practical reason primary and forces us to say, look, the practical aspect of consciousness is what is fundamental. Why? Because we become aware through our own awareness of our self-awareness of our freedom to act. I am essentially free as a conscious being. And how am I free? Well, not in a physical sense connected to the physical world. There I may or may not be. Instead, it's in terms of my consciousness itself. I can be aware of various things. I can direct my consciousness to various things. I can actually put that awareness of my own self-awareness in the background, as it were, and focus on things outside of me. Or I can make it the focus of my own consciousness. I can focus on that awareness of my own self-awareness. And so he recognizes that essential to consciousness is not only self-consciousness, it is freedom. It is the ability to direct my mind as I choose. And so here Fichte is really setting himself apart from the entire philosophical tradition. It has been common throughout philosophy to think of the mind as something like a mirror of the world, or as a camera recording the world, as in any case, passive. Think about Hume's image of impressions being made on the mind by something outside of it. Well, maybe outside of it. In any case, he talks about impressions. That's a concept that goes all the way back to the Stoics, all the way back to the ancient Greeks. And throughout that entire period, the mind is thought, in perception at least, as being primarily passive. Fichte says, that's not right at all. I direct my own mind to various things. Right now I'm looking at the camera, but I can also look out the window. I can look at the curtains. I can look at the walls. I can look at the bookshelf over in that direction. I can begin reflecting on myself and not say anything at all. I can begin reflecting on the nature of my own voice and the sound. In short, I have the freedom to direct my own mind as I want. And he says, that freedom is really fundamental to me as a conscious being. So once I become aware of myself in this way, I'm aware of my own freedom. But I'm also aware that my own freedom is limited. Yes, I can think about all sorts of things. I can direct my consciousness to all sorts of things. But not toward anything at all. I can imagine a unicorn, but I can't direct my consciousness to one in the sense of perceiving one in this room, or anywhere else for that matter. There are all sorts of things that right now I cannot do and I cannot perceive. I might wish that right now I were riding a roller coaster at Six Flags over Texas, but I'm not, okay? And I can't immediately put myself there. So I become aware that in addition to myself and my own consciousness and the freedom that goes along with that, I've also got limitations on my freedom. There is a not I that is opposed to the I, opposed simply in the sense of being external to it, being something that is different from me and limits my own freedom. So yes, I've got huge freedom in reflecting, in thinking about all sorts of things, but it is not unlimited. I am aware that I am a limited being. There are things I can imagine that I cannot do. There are things I can't even imagine, and I can be aware that I can't even imagine them. And so if that's right, then they're going to be, well, not only limitations to my mind and my freedom, but also there is an essential awareness of those limitations. So I become aware not only of myself, but also that there is something other than me, that I am not everything. I am not the universe. Well, all of this implies that imagination and will are essential to the I. After all, what gives me the freedom is the ability to imagine things. But what confronts me with the limitations of my own freedom 
is my will to some extent. I think I can will anything I want. And then I quickly become aware, well, <laughs> I can't do anything I want. I may will it in the sense of trying. I can't succeed. I can go to the gym and think I'm going to bench press 300 pounds today. Well, that doesn't mean I'm doing it uh, or capable of doing it. I can imagine it. I'm trying to work in that general direction, but I'm pretty far away from it. It is not something I can simply do. And so I can be imagining all sorts of things. I can be willing and trying to do all sorts of things. Doesn't mean I can do them. Now, Fichte says this puts consciousness in a very interesting position. The self is in a way divided against itself. Why? Well, freedom is always limited by the not I. But the I posits its freedom absolutely. The I says, look, I am free. I should be able to think and imagine and reflect on anything I want. That means that we naturally tend to will what we imagine and desire, and we become aware that we can't always achieve it. We become aware of our own limits. We try to overcome limits. We naturally do that. We try to change the world and ourselves to bring things in line with our freedom, our freedom to imagine and to will. But we can't always do it. Now, Fichte says we shouldn't identify with any particular state of our being, with any determinate identity. We're more than any of that. We are essentially free. And so it's fine to think of yourself as, well, in my case, a philosophy professor, or as a ditch digger, or as a musician, or as fill in the blank, anything you like. But he says, no identity of that kind exhausts who you are. Your will, your mind, your imagination, your ability to reflect, all of those are absolutely free. You can become more than what you are and what you identify as. So don't limit yourself. The world is going to limit you plenty. Don't limit yourself and impose internal limits to your own identity. Whatever you imagine is true of you. Whatever you identify as and with, you're more than that. And you can be much more than that.